and welcome. Mon nom est Ingrid Bachmann, je suis directrice au programme de maîtrise en art visuel à l'Université Concordia. Et il me fait énormément plaisir de vous accueillir à cet événement dans la série d'art invité, Conversation en art contemporain. Hi, my name is Ingrid Bachmann. I'm delighted to see so many of you. Um, I'm a grad graduate program director in the MFA Studio Arts area. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this lecture in this series of conversations in contemporary art. Um, we are full, and I'm really sorry we have to keep these, these sort of aisles clear. Um, I'd like to introduce Professor Janet Werner, who many of you already know, who's going to give the introduction to our guest speaker tonight, uh, David Balzer. So, Janet? Thank you, Ingrid. <laughs> Oh, this is for a tall person. This has already been adjusted. <laughs> I can readjust it. So and lower. Lower, lower down. Lower. Okay. Whoa. Oh, take it off. There you go. There we go. Um, so, yeah, it is wonderful to see so many people here tonight and uh, to have David here in town. Um, David uh, was born in Winnipeg and is now based in Toronto. Um, he's an author, an art critic, editor, and teacher. And he's written about art, film, and culture for The Believer, The Globe and Mail, Art Forum, Modern Painters, um, and others. And he is currently the so associate editor of Canadian Art Magazine. Um, his first book, a collection of short fiction entitled Contrivances, was released in 2012. And he's here in Montreal on the occasion of the publication of his new book uh, called Curationism, um, How Curating Took Over the Art World and Everything Else. <laughs> Um, nice title, and I'm really happy to have it actually in my hands now because I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Um, David's also here for the launch of another book, which I want to mention, a book that he contributed an essay to on Margot Williamson's work, and that is going to be launched tomorrow at Drawn and Quarterly at 7 o'clock. Um, tonight, however, he's speaking about a curation, curationism, a topic which will be close to many artists' hearts, I think. Um, as in the art world, since the 90s, curators have been shaping um, large institutional shows and um, uh, biennials acting as arbiters, tastemakers, advisors, and ambassadors for us, um, speaking as an artist. Um, in his new book, he examines the origins and nature of the role of the curator, as well as the mania for curating in popular culture, uh, whereby it seems that now everyone is a curator. So where did curating come from? How can it be related to our understanding of the avant-garde, uh, value-making, and of work? And he asks, um, have we now perhaps reached a curationist saturation point? Have contemporary curating's many paradoxes and paranoia paranoias led to its undo own undoing? So um, please join me in welcoming David Balzer. Thanks, Janet. I'm just going to raise this and drop the microphone. Maybe I won't. Here we go. I also wanted to take this opportunity to thank the <laughs> Art History Department and the Department of Painting and Drawing for contributing to this evening's lecture. Thank you for dropping the mic. <laughs> Love a good mic drop. Uh, Very appreciated. I'm just gonna hold this. I don't need to sleep. Hey, thank you everybody for coming. It's really great to see everyone. Um, so I'll just get into it. Um, so as you're no doubt familiar, uh, we now hear the noun curator and variations on the verb to curate commonly, uh, particularly the passive transitive construction curated by. Uh, and indeed the, the verbal adjective curated, uh, with their pretenses towards authorship and their cute, unusual flourishes. Um, as of now, uh, the verb to curate is actually only a draft edition in the Oxford English Dictionary. It's not a real word, and, that's, and, that, and that is proven to you when you type it out in Microsoft Word, and there's still that red squiggly line underneath it. Um, so we in the art world, um, or a lot of us tend to look askance at this, um, at these uppity amateurs, these people calling themselves by this name. Can you really be a curator on the internet? 
uh, can say the musician and producer Pharrell Williams, and indeed the art world people who enlist him, um, he really be serious about his curating? Uh, don't you need to know things about art to be a curator? Don't you need to be a connoisseur to have sophistication, to have training? Don't you need a degree or something like that? Um, so when I started this book, I wanted to dispel this attitude, which I... Hold it together a little, yeah. We want to see if we can put it back in here. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it, may, it may be uh, sensitive enough that it doesn't need to be super close. Yeah, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's good? Yeah. Okay. So when I wrote this book, I wanted to dispel this attitude, which I found hypocritical and a bit snobby, um, the notion of the other curator and, um, by implication, the inferior curator. Um, so I wanted to show a direct connection, a lineage of the curator in the West. Um, so not only an intentional through line from ancient Rome, where they had bureaucratic curatores, um, who filled honorific positions um, of caretaking and overseeing through to the early collector culture of the 16th and 17th centuries to the emergence of the early museum and the salon um, and then the advent of um, modernism and the autonomous artist uh, come entrepreneur um, and then the birth of the really the birth of the contemporary curator in the conceptualist moment of the 1960s and 1970s. Is the mic dead? Um, Can, you hear? Can you hear back there? Great. So, and then ultimately, as Janet was talking about, the curator's ascendance in the 1990s. So, not all of this, this lineage, um, but also to demonstrate that the next logical step is the curator becoming all of us um, in what has uh, been become known as the cognitive um, economy or the cognitive cultural economy. Um, so there is the fact, the important fact, that all famous curators to date um, have yet to hold degrees uh, actually specializing in curation. Um, now this is a perceived problem by the cognitive cultural economy, and so because it's so credentialist, it has actually invented curatorial studies programs um, <laughs> to address and correct this problem. Um, but moreover, the art world curator and the amateur curator, and by amateur curator, of course, I mean all of us, especially as we exist in front of our various screens, um, have in common an acute awareness of an audience. And the curator in any guise, I argue, imparts value. And through a conceptualist, de-skilled, de-skilled understanding of work, performs this value. It is this performance of value that I call curationism. And I believe it to be one of the defining features of our time, both inside the art world and outside of it. So obviously, this word curationism recalls creationism uh, with its grand narratives and uh, its obsession with divine authorship. So that's one of my little jokes with the title. Um, the name also takes to task uh, the art world's strained relationship with language, because Janet could barely say a word. Um, <laughs> it's, so the art world likes to invent words mangle grammatic lucidity in an attempt to make itself seem both more radical and more authoritative. And I'd like to um, point out that the magazine Triple Canopy, Canopy, sorry, Triple Canopy recently dubbed this strange contemporary dialect, um, one that you see almost in every gallery didactic and artist statement, international art English. Um, <laughs> but moreover, uh, curationism with its knowing uh, ism, uh, suffix ism, suggests cur cur sorry, the curator's intimate relationship with what has become known as critical theory, particularly French post-structuralism, a body of work that has changed the contemporary university profoundly, maintaining a firm grip in turn on the millennial art world. It is important to state that with this book, I wanted not only to address the relationship between the art world and the non-art world curator, 
but also to do so in a clear yet intelligent language that did not involve or rely on critical theory for explanations or precedent. I am a generalist and a journalist and a critic. So we have mistaken many critical theorists as essentialist owners of ideas, as figures do their attribution, whether or not they intended this for themselves. Shorthand academia now refers, for example, to the concept of the panopticon as Foucault's only, not Jeremy Bentham's. It refers to any appearance of a mirror as exclusively Lacan's, when in fact, Lacan's idea of the mirror stage was in opposition to Freud's own notion of id and ego, his own writings on narcissism, and this idea of the mirror can be traced back at least as far as, say, Narcissus himself. <laughs> So both the curator, the curator and critical theory thus give us the pretense of newness, a pretense of newness to things that are not necessarily new. Um, their model is the avant-garde. And the avant-garde is a modernist idea which can be defined by poet Ezra Pound's famous dictum, make it new. Even though we popularly tend to think about avant-garde as merely being experimental or edgy. Um, but the avant-garde represents the ultimate performance of value. Uh, this thing is new. This thing's newness is its value. This thing's newness will attract an audience. In presenting this thing's newness, I, the curator, perform that newness, underlining it and ensuring you of its value, of which you may not be certain and may even doubt. Uh, so one need hardly mention that the avant-garde and capitalism are intimately intertwined. Um, so I don't know, witness the new uh, Apple Watch and iPhone 6, and uh, don't get me started on Steve Jobs as a curator. Um, <laughs> but we now live in an age in which everyone, and this includes businesses and corporations, um, fancies themselves a curator, um, performing their own, their own very own form of, if not newness, uh, the novelty, and uh, arranging objects and things, not just in service of those things, but in service of themselves. Um, so, it's a problem. When the curator curates herself and her curatorial peers, and when everyone is a curator, well, you can see how complicated it might become, and yet, how simple. Um, we have reached, I argue, the saturation point of curationism. When curating is templated, algorithmed, crowdsourced, the very definition of curating as fine-tuned selection and arbitration um, as to repeat the performative bestowal of unique or novel value becomes deeply ironic. The popularization of curating might have affected its suicide. It might have affected the death of the avant-garde itself, at least culturally and aesthetically. How did this happen? Dear audience, a brief tale of curationism in five and a half chapters. <laughs> Chapter one, Robert Hooke and the Cabinets of Curiosities. Robert Hooke was curator of experiments for London's Royal Society in Restoration England. Aside from the Roman curatore and the medieval curate or parish priest, this is an early example of the title curator as we know it today. Hook was a famous rival of Sir Isaac Newton's and was by some accounts an idea thief. By other accounts, the unsung Leonardo da Vinci of early enlightenment England. And I should note that this painting is not a period painting, but it is in fact from 2004 um, <laughs> because it is thought that the only portrait of Robert Hooke to exist was slashed because he was such a controversial figure and seen as such an idea thief. Um, so among other things, Robert Hooke pioneered microscopic imaging. He pioneered watchmaking, in particular the little springs that were and still are in watches. As Royal Society curator, he was responsible for putting on weekly demonstrations of material from the society's repository a trove of curious specimens. Ideally, the repository was to have one of everything. Um, and this platonic notion of the comprehensive collection, uh, very biblical in nature, 
uh, plagued early muse museums, which were notoriously overstuffed and often contained copies or fakes of original objects and unattainable objects. Um, so Hooke's demonstrations, which put him in the role of inter intermediary between the private thing-filled repository and the public audience of the society, were theatrical experiments. He was demonstrating these objects, um, showing and explaining the repository's many wonders. So Hooke the curator was both dependent and independent. His brilliant mind as curator of experiments was on display, uh, but limited to what the contents of the repository could show. His experiments were in service of the society meant to heighten its value and that of its uh, the repository's objects. And in fact, uh, Robert Hooke might have ruined his health from spending too much time in the repository, which of course is, is an example, and we have many of these early Enlightenment scholars who give their entire sort of physical being over to the study of objects and their natures. Um, so the Royal Society's repository will sound, this, all of this should sound familiar to you, um, but specifically to students of art history it will sound familiar because it will recall the uh, Cabinet of Curiosities or the German Kunstkammer or Wunderkammer. Um, and these are actually um, sort of the starting point, the main Western precursors uh, to museums. And their creator custodians, their curators, Pre precursors to contemporary curators. Um, they were eclectic mixes of amateur and professional, committed both to connoisseurship and the caretaking of objects. Um, side note, curious and curator both have that same Latin root cura. Care in Latin connotes both custodianship and taking an interest in something. Um, so cabinets, the cabinets of curiosities, as you may or may not know, were rooms typically belonging to royalty, aristocrats, wealthy merchants, which, like the Royal Society's repository, contained sundry objects of importance, from religious to geological. Um, in many respects, the cabinets were endemic of their time, which saw a fervent interest in colonial exploration, expansion, as well as in humanist scientific research, um, and thus in the desire to house and catalog the objects of such endeavors. Cataloging, cataloging, cataloging. The cabinets of curiosities were exclusive, not commonly open to the public. Nevertheless, the curator was positioned importantly within that cabinet, which for many owners was microcosmic. And again, we come back to biblical metaphors. It was a mini Eden over which the collector held exclusive domain and their curator acted as a sort of atom, um, care tent, sorry, sorry, taking care of the world that they had, um, had presented. Uh, so the multidisciplinary quality of Renaissance and early Enlightenment scholarship is very appealing to the contemporary mind. The, the cabinets of curiosity becoming a renewed fixation um, in the mixed media grab bag contemporary art world. Um, so uh, you guys can probably think of a lot of recent shows that were modeled after the cabinets of curiosity. Um, the internet is a digital cabinet of curiosity. Um, the new Cirque du Soleil production in Toronto is called Curios and is based on the Cabinets of Curiosity. Um, so the Cabinet of Curiosity might also be allied to the concept of the ready-made, uh, still so very popular in current artistic practices, and forged, of course, in the early 20th century by Marcel Duchamp uh, with his exhibition of mundane industrial objects, um, including shovels and famously an upturned urinal. Duchamp would also wonder Kammer himself, of course, uh, with a series of boîtes en valise, portable suitcase-like museums containing his own work. Chapter two. Um, it would, however, be those uh, cohorts of artists before Duchamp that truly pioneered contemporary curating and in turn the modern museum. Uh, so, of course, in 19th century France, artists began to reject the constellation hanging style of the academic salon, which, as you know from the, from the idea of the salon style hang, um, the salon would sky work, so would purposely place works they deemed not so important, kind of near the ceiling to the back. Um, so artists rejected this. Um, in 1855, for instance, Gustave Courbet, himself never really rejected by the Salon, nonetheless opened his pavilion of realism next to the Exposition Universelle where the Salon was housed. Um, this obviously is a 
very, can be seen as a very entrepreneurial gesture. Later in the century, the Impressionists, of course, began to show their own works privately, and through the advocacy of dealers like uh, Paul Durand-Ruel, uh, began to um, uh, become more autonomous. In both cases, a cleaner, cleaner hang, so non-salon hangs of work, um, started to emerge. Eye-level hangs, um, symmetrical hangs, uh, so the romantics in us might see these early modernist forms of curating as a bid for freedom, the artists breaking the shackles. Um, well, they were this to a certain extent. They were, as I was mentioning and with respect to Courbet, a performance of value for the work. They were entrepreneurial. By isolating the object more, these artists, and occasionally dealers, emphasized the object's uniqueness and thereby the, very, the, the minute details of its worth. So as the 20th century dawned, certain European museum directors and institutions made innovations also in this direction. Um, the great um, Wilhelm von Bode in Berlin with his Pergamon Museum um, is an early, that was an early example of minimalist, modernist exhibition design um, in displaying that famous Hellenist altar, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen in Berlin. Stunning. Um, Soon, groups like the Bauhaus, um, groups like the Futurists, uh, the Vorticists, et cetera, et cetera, would stand as representatives of that newfangled word of the 1910s, the avant-garde. Um, the bumptious, puerile Italian Futurists wanted to demolish museums, comparing them with libraries and rightly associated them with jumbled, um, dusty commitments to the past um, rather than the future. Um, and Gertrude Stein has been attributed this, what is now thought of as an apocryphal quote, but is nonetheless very entertaining. And she repeatedly, but probably didn't say, you can be a museum or you can be modern, but you can't be both. <laughs> but it was an American, um, Alfred H. Barr Jr., whom you see up there, who was the director of New York's uh, museum, first director of New York's Museum of Modern Art, and this is the statement to which um, Stein's uh, quip supposedly applies, he proved her and the futurists and all of those other avant-garde people wrong. He assimilated the avant-garde. He built the MoMA in lockstep with avant-garde ideas. Alfred Barr minted contemporary exhibition design, including the very notion of the white cube, I mean, arguably, um, and also the idea of the contemporary curator, um, who is crucially informed by everything artists do. Um, in borrowing heavily from Europe as an American, uh, collaborating with and indeed pinching ideas from artists, many ideas, uh, favoring group shows, um, and mingling works of art from different time periods and cultures to, to illustrate various um, influences and themes, Alfred H. Barr proved the museum could be as thrilling and theatrical as the machines the futurists so fetishized, such as the automobile. He proved that the museum could be both a machine itself and a temple to machines, influencing their display, even their manufacture. In 1951, in fact, MoMA opened a show called Eight Automobiles, which was an exhibition of cars. And there are a lot of great little delicious ironies um, when you think about Alfred Barr and the Futurist's denigration of museums. It's as if he read the Futurist Manifesto and decided that he was gonna show them. Um, so, Barr's, so Barr imported ideas and people from Europe and Russia. I'll run them down for you. The clean, white, minimalist display style of people like Wilhelm von Bode and those of burgeoning European artist houses or Kunsthalles. The geometric latticework exhibition design of Russian constructivist L. Lizitsky. Bauhaus methodology, including lecture programs, labels, and explanations for works. These we see in museums to this day. Alfred Barr always aggregated and assimilated European ideas. He never left them quite as they were. He created a very American concoction. <laughs> Uh, the, abil the ability to impart value, to perform value, to repeat myself again, was of utmost importance. MoMA's mission was to articulate the modern across disciplines, regions, even time. MoMA made the historical modern. Barr's favoring of minimalism in exhibition, his signature was exhibiting painting symmetrically in one neat eye-level horizontal line, and it's arguable 
did Stieglitz do, Stieglitz do this first? Did Barr do this first? Who knows? But Barr is kind of the, the representative of this style. Um, and uh, he always <coughs> exhibited the, the paintings against um, a wall covered in light beige monk's cloth. So it wasn't quite pure white, it was off-white. Um, so he lent everything a very formalist air. Um, he also, among his many accomplishments, he had a show called Useful Objects, um, which beginning in the late 1930s displayed reasonably priced, and this is in the, during the Depression, displayed reasonably <coughs> priced consumer goods as if they were objet d'art, um, and used them as an example of accessible industrial commercial design. So placed in the context of bars and his colleagues' very streamlined, sleek spaces, <coughs> anything looked valuable, anything. Anything was valuable, meaningful, and modern. So now in this sense, then Duchamp may have invented the ready-made, but it was, really was Alfred Barr who most expertly appropriated it and understood its significance and allure. Um, you know, and everything we see now in department store displays can almost be traced back to Alfred Barr. Um, now, uh, if any of you guys have read um, Marianne Staniszewski's book, very famous book, The Power of Display, she makes a really interesting point that the department store very much resembled, before the modernist era, very much resembled the museum. So it was this cluttered, kind of dusty, weird space. And then with the advent of modernism, with the advent of you know, fetishization of architects and design and people like Alfred Barr, we had the department store, which looked a lot like the MoMA. Um, so chapter three, Harold Seyman and the Conceptual Curator. So as all of you I'm sure are familiar, in the 1960s and 1970s, the art world turned conceptual, privileging idea over material. This strange project to dematerialize the art object, in the words of one of the earliest contemporary curators, Lucy Lepard, was not easy to articulate or to translate. I almost, can, to me, it almost seems comparable to like um, when Rome finally went Christian and they had all these councils to try to make sense of Christianity vis-a-vis -vis paganism and it just didn't make sense. So this is kind of where we were at in the conceptualist moment. It's like, okay, we need to have some meetings about this. Um, <laughs> So there, became, so there became a yearning to make sense of things um, for someone to act as an advocate for an ever more obtuse factionalist art scene. So many artists, so many movements, so many works and so many shows, uh, so much discussion. Who would parse all of this? The emerging curator's new position entailed duties of ringleader, translator, mediator, diplomat, gatekeeper. It was a full-time job and really a completely new one. Um, so in my book, I talk at length about Swiss curator Harold Seyman, who is pictured, a figure of ever-growing romantic interest among contemporary art circles, and one who, as it were, sets the stage for the very theatrical presentation of the avant-garde. Seyman's background was, in fact, in the theater, and he presents as a sort of anti-Alfred Barr, working with institutions but with a degree of difficulty and resembling more of an artist than Barr's gentlemanly museum director, uh, Seyman with his characteristic full beard, tussled hair, and loose, partially unbuttoned shirts. <laughs> Harold Seyman was part of a cohort of emerging contemporary curators, among them Lucy Lepard, Walter Hopps, Seth Siegelob, and others. So former plumber Seth Siegelob, very much a New Yorker, blurred the roles of dealer and curator above all acting as a staunch, even heroic advocate and defender for the artists he represented and the difficult work they made. Siegelob's concept of demystification is key to my book. On the surface, conceptual curators were reacting against Barr's aggressive, fetishistic formalism. And why wouldn't they? With his now famous show at Kunsthalle Bern, Live in Your Head, When Attitudes Become Form, Harold Seyman aimed to present conceptual art conceptually, demystifying the conditions of exhibition that Barr worked so, so hard to mystify with his very modernist and very architectural performance of value. For attitudes, 
in Kunsthalle Bern, artist Lawrence Weiner chipped away a square in the plaster on a wall. Michael Heitzer smashed the concrete on the sidewalk in front of the building. Alain Jacquet tore out the wiring system. So here the museum literally falls apart in service of art. It couldn't be more different than Bar and MoMA. Yet the emerging conceptualist curator also, through this demystifying, affects a re-mystifying of the conditions of exhibition. Seth Siegelob printed gorgeous, gorgeous, minimalist fold-out poster invitations for shows of work such as Robert Berry's Inert Gas series. And for, the, for, for, for that series, Berry promises to release inert gas into the atmosphere. That's the work. Um, but the invitations that represent this work are expensive, now coveted historical documents, rematerializing this immaterial work. Um, another form of remystification involved the figure of the cur curator himself. By the time he curated Documenta in the 1970s, Harold Seyman was controversial, with artists reacting against his aggressive thematic presentation of work, often without their will or consent. In the process of remystification, the curator slowly becomes the focus. The curator ushers forth the avant-garde, not making, but shaping it new. Um, and one of these maked and shaped entities is the curator himself. The curator not only demystifies, but remystifies, and then self-mystifies, becoming fascinating and vexing in equal measure. Chapter four. The 1990s, the Western art institution, beleaguered by funding cuts through the 1980s, looked hungrily to audiences and donors for attention and funds. The conceptualist curator, once an outlier to large institutions, relatively, uh, especially in North America, becomes the key player in this gambit, this culture war. Large institutions began collecting contemporary work in part to appear more relevant, but also in part because the market for art historical works was completely drying up. Um, as a performer of value, and as a leading member of the avant-garde, the curator brought performance of value and performance of newness to the despairing institution of the 1990s. As was the plan, at least, the curator aimed to attract new demographics and monies to refresh in the process, the curator may also have euthanized the avant-garde. So audience courting defines the institutionalization of all of the major aesthetic fixations of the 1990s, and I'll list what I feel to be the major ones. Number one, identity politics, as typified by the divisive 1993 Whitney Biennial, which showed an unprecedented number of works by women, non-white, and queer artists. Number two, 90s aesthetic fixations, ongoing commitment to controversy and provocation, as typified by the 1997 exhibition, Sensation, coming from the Saatchi collection in London, and then in 1999, when it comes to the Brooklyn Museum, as you may know, it was denounced by Giuliani as sick stuff. Number three, <laughs> number three aesthetic fixations of the 1990s, relational aesthetics. In which, in which artists engage in social practices in galleries and museums as a way of acknowledging audiences and institutional frameworks. <laughs> and lastly, biennials, nationally or internationally ordered group exhibitions with distinct institutional ties, global tourism mandates, and more than 40 biennials were inaugurated in the 1990s alone. In all of these trends, the curator is dominant indispensable as agent, ambassador, organizer, facilitator, and provocateur. Hans Ulrich Obrist, whom you see proliferated before and uh, behind me, was probably the most famous curator of our time. He is a figure who emerged from this period to cross, eventually cross over to popular culture with his voluminous interviews with a variety of intellectual figures, his alliances with powerful architects and munificent art fairs, and his courtship of celebrities such as Kanye West. Obrist is the consummate institutional performer. 
Currently at the Serpentine in London, he self-mythologizes as a curator who is hungry for information, claiming to read a book a day, one who is disdainful of sleep, who has tried all of his life to beat it, and is thus fearful of time, uh, one who is omnipresent, known for his hyper-travel and general inexhaustibility. Hans Ulrich Obrist represents one of the key traits of what has become known as the star or power curator, utopian thinking, in which the gallery acts as a site both of social transformation and self-aware critique. And of course, utopia in Greek means both good place and no place. No contemporary star curator claims perfection. And this is an important caveat. They're not dumb people. In the demystifying, remystifying tradition of the curator, the contemporary star curator proclaims failure and success in equal measure, readily absorbing critique, even disdaining the capitalist art system of which they are inevitably a part. Yet all the while, the star curator espouses an aggressive commitment to art and artists. Art and artists drive them. Institutions have learned a great deal from this. It's basically the new institutional rule book. Institutions program events that on the surface appear to self-deconstruct, to self-critique, to call into question the very idea of the institution, but in the process to draw direct attention to themselves. And this is something that is pretty much a scary concomitant of critical theory, of course, as critical theory has done the same thing in academia where you know, we pay lots of money as members of the bourgeoisie to sit in classes and discuss how problematic we are. <laughs> so, similarly, the institution is no longer, is no longer afraid of dissent. The, the smart institution welcomes it with open arms because it would only increase their value and make their value more performative. Um, Sorry, that was a digression. <laughs> so the star curator's manicuring of dissent extends not only to themselves, um, uh, but, or uh, rather, not only to work, but to themselves. For instance, the weird glamour shots we see of celebrity curators and gallery pamphlets and listservs like Eflux, which uh, journalist Nadja Sayez recently referred to as curator porn. <laughs> but not only this, um, curators have become obsessed with their own work. Um, and this is what I call exhibitions porn, in which curators turn to read the recent past of the conceptualist moment, aggressively canonize it, calling it art historical, grooming it, and fetishizing it. So curatorial restagings of so-called landmark conceptualist shows, I mean, this can be extended all the way down to just this sort of predilection to make art about art. Um, so. They are akin to sort of like, I would say, like a band, a, an old band reuniting and playing their classic album live from start to finish. So these kinds of shows are very commonplace. So for example, When Attitudes Become Form was restaged in Venice in 2013. Um, and this year alone, uh, Jens Hoffman, another star curator, whom in my book I call the Weird Al Yankovic of star curators, <laughs> restaged restage and reimagine uh, Kynaston McShine's famous um, minimalist uh, sculpture show called Primary uh, Structures at uh, the Jewish Museum in New York, where it um, debuted. Chapter five and five, five. Okay. It is not difficult to make the final extension of this path of the performance of value. Real celebrities, rather than celebrity curators, are now curating. One might see Madonna as the template, for she's a performer above all, and her entire career has been precisely based on the modus operandi of the institutional curator, in which the avant-garde and its brash newness is selected, is ordered, and is manicured for a larger public to digest. You name it, Madonna has appropriated it and assimilated it. This sort of appropriation has, you know, several decades after Madonna, become boringly commonplace. Um, so from Beyonce's appropriation of 
you know, Anne de Kiersmacher's choreography, Lady Gaga's <coughs> appropriation of what everything under the sun. <laughs> this, so this was once a fringe gesture, and I guess Madonna might have been the first mainstream person to articulate this fringe gesture, seen in things like, you know, early hip hop culture, dance and DJ culture, turntablism. That it has, however, become the primary mode of supercharging a brand. Um, and turning heads, and it is deeply, deeply colonialist and intense. Um, in fast fashion, for instance, which is quickly killing uh, the avant-garde spirit of the fashion industry, an industry that, unlike the art world and the art world's avant-garde, never blanched at its relationship to uh, capitalism or corporate culture, um, but fast fashion is killing the avant-garde spirit of the fashion industry and has become a driving business practice. So one of cura curationism's main promises is a targeted individuality within the concept of the social and the shared. In turn, corporations have appropriated the word curated in order to present value under the false guise of exclusivity. We might cycle back to Alfred Barr here and his useful object shows, which I told you about in the 1930s, or to Duchamp's ready-made. Anything looks valuable if it's presented and performed as such. And I'm sure all of you can think of the many stores and brands and change that promise specificity in retail experience. Ikea, Restoration Hardware, Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, and all of those fast food places which now let you choose your ingredients. All of these come to mind for me. And now, of course, we all curate ourselves. We are all our own mini momas. The curator is all of us, self-conscious and desperate for an audience. Real life ways of establishing consumer identity, including the home display of books, records, CDs, DVDs, have fallen out of fashion. Independent brick and mortar book, video, and music stores continue to close. The internet flattened being and media mergers flattened content. In partial response to this niche marketing, we began branding Personae online first via blogging, then via social media. This culture is predicated on anxiety and paranoia. As, as anxious and paranoid as the institution of the 1990s was, so we are, uh, not about being cashed up, which we are anyway in this recession era, but about our indi own individuality. It is a needy performance of singularity and power against the dominance of culture business colonizers such as Amazon.com. One of the disturbing aspects of this performance of value online is not just its failed promise of individuality or even through entities such as the like button, its denigration of true novelty, true creativity, true understanding, analysis, or expression. As social media users, we are working around the clock. We are drones. Social media sites now use our curatorial work as free market research data. Big data mining, including information on what you searched for and clicked on, is valuable capital. With Google, for instance, claiming it can track the spread of a flu virus based on geographically specific word searches. In a dismal full circle, the Essel Museum in Klossenburg, Austria, hosted the exhibition Like It in 2013, giving Facebook users access to images from their permanent collection and assembling a show based on what got the most likes. <laughs> <laughs> the Art Everywhere project, originating in the UK and now in American cities this summer, asks people to vote online for their favorite institutional work, exhibiting the winners on billboards. This is akin to publishers posting potential book covers on social media and making decisions influenced by what is most popular. It is also called content farming. It is outsourcing disguised as interactivity, or another buzzword, engagement. It also prompts the question, exactly how definitively curatorial can crowdsourcing, can mass curation be? Culture moves faster than its critics. My inclination is, as I stated at the beginning, that this mania for the curated is, due to its explosiveness, waning. The cultural price we have paid for curationism is the death of the avant-garde, at least as regards uh, its idea of the new. The best cultural products are no longer those that have never been done before, that detonate all that came before them. 
And this, I argue, is not necessarily a bad thing. We, but we do stand at a crossroads. Uh, down one path is a sort of brain freeze or bed death created by the hoarding and dystopian imperatives of curationism. But down the other is a profound reconsideration in which obsolescence itself becomes obsolete. Notions of selfhood and expressions thereof become more complex and less templated, and value ceases to require the strained, anxious performance of the curator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, maybe we'll open it up for some questions? Sure, sure. No questions? Do you have a question? Um, I think I do. Um, I, um, there's two things. Um, one that follows from your, your five moments that you outlined. Um, and um, I would just uh, raise the question of, of the, um, the element uh, that seems really important in this history of, of the uncoupling of the exhibition from co collection. Yeah. And how that really opened up a kind of space, not only um, in institutionally, uh, but also outside of institutions for a uh, different range, sometimes other, you might call them star curators, uh, curators as well, but not curators like uh, Leotard, for mm -hmm. instance. Yeah. Uh, but also a, a really a wide range of practices that were no longer institutionally based, because that seems to uh, account for a certain kind of level of, of this uh, dispersal and this kind of sense that, that there's a lot of other possibilities for how one can approach and think about exhibitions and the spaces for them and the audiences for them and, and all of all of that relationship. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I could just try that I have something else to Yeah, no, it's very interesting. And I guess then that like this is a this is a good time to sort of like issue a mea culpa and then the fact that like that this trajectory is focused on that <laughs> Is maybe focused a bit on a sort of a pessimistic reading of what, like, of what the avant-garde affected and what the modernist impulse affected. Um, when you know, I mean, if, I think I think increasingly, and this is just my opinion, as we look back on the 20th century, it's just so explosive with new ideas and approaches, just so much possibility. Um, and um, I guess the thing that disturbs me is the degree to which those amazing things became assimilated institutionally. Um, but your statement about um, collections is also interesting. And I write about this in my book. Um, collections are now kind of performing curation um, when you know they, they weren't necessarily doing that. Um, so, and in fact, there are some collections um, Many collections, which I'm sure you're aware of in the world, I don't know, I'm thinking right now, the, the David Roberts Foundation in, in London, um, where the collection, the display of the collection itself seems eminently institutional, almost more successfully institutional than the institution, than, uh, than, than more famous institutions. I don't know if I'm answering your question or. No, it's, um, uh, although I think also the, the collection has itself become a very interesting site for critical uh, engagement. Mm -hmm. Institution that also yeah. people and then we have things like the like the, the the Bard program, which is based on a collection in which you know people learning how to curate are engaging very intimately with this kind of interesting collection, which is which is both exciting and problematic, but nonetheless it's happening. I, I like to I'm trying to sort of get come to terms with, with you know the, everyone is a, a, a curator, uh, uh, but one of the things I, I would also um, I guess I would take issue with a little bit is um, when you're talking about curators kind of curating their own uh, or kind of addressing their own past exhibitions. Because uh, one of the things that seems quite interesting in this field of, of curation is, is that um, there really wasn't a discourse about curating. As you say, there totally. really wasn't even a word. Totally. There certainly weren't any schools and, and so on. And now, of course, it's becoming much more institutionalized. Yeah. And so that uh, kind of self-reflexivity of the field and the evolution of that over the last couple of decades has really been quite interesting too, because the art historical model would simply look at 
the artworks individually about the relational thing, about the spatial yeah. thing, what, what is going on as a whole. So I, I'm, I would be disinclined to disdain mm -hmm. that, that sort of reflexivity so, uh, on, yeah. on that. That's I totally agree with you, and it's such a good point to bring up. And it's obviously, I, this, is a, this is like a 40 minute talk, so I can't bring the nuance, um, a degree of nuance to it. I do talk about that in my book, and I think it's absolutely essential. There are a few things to say around that. I mean, I think it's absolutely refreshing that students can now learn about the conditions of exhibition making, which are so key to understanding what an artwork is all about and what art movements mean. Um, I think that, you know, the ang I didn't say this in my talk, but I think the anxiousness, the anxiousness that surrounds sort of the performance of value within curators comes from a good place. Um, in the 1990s, it's the you know the like you know we we look at we go to museums we don't we don't you guys have wonderful art institutions in the city that don't necessarily condescend the way some of our institu art institutions in Toronto do but for example at the Art Gallery of Ontario one of their mandates is that you know the didactics can't be above a grade nine reading level everything is just kind of what do you think what do you want to do <laughs> and, you know while we can while we can we can make a direct connection between these kinds of things and a relational aesthetics. We can also say that this is a perversion of relational aesthetics and that this is a paranoid sort of protestation against the fact that the art institution is under the gun, has, has received so many so much funding cuts, has been threatened so much, and this is what we're left with. Um, speaking of those protestations though, another interesting point that you raise is that there's there's always a tone to the needful establishment of new canons that is a bit performative and a bit kind of desperate and a bit sort of grossly underlining because it needs to happen, you know? And this is what, you know, we see this in in the establishment of a lot of sort of like non-white and non-Western canons where we're trying to create a new canon. Um, and the idea obviously is that we don't we don't want it to be we don't want to fall into the same traps of canonization that we're trying to react against. So it's kind of this weird, thorny issue. And the same thing is happening with the, the history of exhibition making. It's so new. It's so shockingly new. Why haven't we, why didn't art history departments talk about the conditions of exhibition making in the 1950s and 1960s? It's this kind of hangover of like the formalist new critical moment. It's really unfortunate. So part of the, maybe some of the, uh, the collateral damage of the fact that we're building this new canon is that we have kind of these like figures like Jens Hoffman muscling in and telling us like you know what the 50 most important contemporary art exhibitions are you know the dust will settle time will tell but at least we're doing that you know somebody who who is, is fascinated with conditions of production um, within the capitalist within capitalist markets, it's absolutely essential, it's absolutely essential that we start talking about exhibition making, for sure. Yeah? Uh, when, when this also, too, this notion, the, the, the popularity, the, the performativeness of, of, of things becoming more popular, everyone is a curator, um, both like within the institution, the curator is kind of this, this um, kind of propels him or her own, their own project as kind of an icon. Thing. Isn't it, um, I mean, it plays out in other art forms as well now, spe specifically movies, there's this self-reflexivity, and, and there is also kind of this idea of, of pulling things from the past, trying to completely um, make them more popular, kind of to tweak them and make them seem more radical and more timely. I mean, isn't the condition of the curator and of the museum or the, the art institution itself just another aspect of what's actually occurring both economically and culturally? Yeah, fully, fully agree, fully agree. But describing it as curating is one way of kind of tying it all together, you know. But you know, the impulse of, you know, for to to use an ex the example that you gave a film, you know, like in the, I mean, in the nineteen nineties, you know, I could write a whole essay about how the film world did similar things, you know, like the film world, you know, in the art world we have. We had biennials emerge in the 1990s in the film world, film festivals, um, all over the place. In the 1990s, we have this, you know, the self-reflexive relational aesthetics happening, and in the film world, we have well, for one, um, 
figures like um, you know, Quentin Tarantino and Paul Thomas Anderson who are very influenced by cinema history and who are trying to create sort of this, um, uh, another Hollywood renaissance um, in protestation perhaps of films like decreasing relevance. So, you know, there's that too. Um, and I think, you know, in the publishing industry, very similar things are happening as well. Um, you know, I mean, in the 90s you have, you know, postmodern literature and the self-reflexive novel, but also in the 90s you have things like um, the bookstore becoming a space, um, not just where you can get books, but where, you know, readings, performances, where like postcards are sold. And then of course, like with Heather Reisman and Oprah and stuff that just kind of like just goes crazy. Yeah, so the so the so that it becomes experiential, you know, experiential um, thing, um, and uh, I think it's all connected. But it just they get my the, my book's a gambit is that it can all be described as sort of curatorial. Um, that's my argument that you can just sort of extend it throughout a lot of not just cultural but you know business practice as well, maybe even sort of sociological phenomena. So no, I totally agree with you. I don't know if I'm not putting words in your mouth, but that you just. <laughs> yes, at the uh, It seems to me, and this follows, I think, on both of these other questions really well, that there's this, like, the marker of self identification in terms of personal cultural capital uh, that has a trajectory through sort of all emergent practices and all emergent media. So the curation thing, I think, there's this interesting. Thing here suddenly we have technology that aggregates things a lot better for people and that kind of offloads some of the labor that would have been done before yes so we can think of this in terms of like five years ago everyone was a dj right um, the the advent of digital photography and videography everyone's a filmmaker someone makes a zine they're a writer like yes. this idea that we're that I th it, it feels like there's something far more akin to identifying ourselves by our practices rather than our profession that I think is a really key kind of yeah. question in uncoupling what's been happening in culture in this way, yeah. if that makes sense. No, it's a really good point. It's like we're just going, th these are phases, like these are growing pains that we're going through in order to, this is the optimistic side, right? These are growing pains that we're going to in order to learn how to articulate ourselves in a much more sophisticated manner. Because I, what I, I mean, my argument, I guess, is like like declaring the, the death of something in light of all of these other trends feels a little um, off, I guess, to me, <laughs> right? Like the advent of the, the Nikon D900 did not kill photography, even though people had access to it, um, you know? the advent of like all of these technologies that people are taking up, whether it's for a hobby or, or something else, doesn't, we have this tendency in culture to declare the death of things, like being part of the zine culture in the 90s, and then by 2000, it was like, well, it's dead, you know? And it, it just doesn't happen that way. And I think that like, that's, the cycle is something that I think is really crucial to sort of like point to, I guess. And we're, we're in a moment, though, where I would argue that we're more acutely aware of that happening than we have been. You know, like that we're more acutely aware that things don't, that we can't dismiss things, and things don't necessarily fall radically out of fashion, never to be remembered again. Like, we're in this process of kind of going through this sort of systematic remembering and holding it onto it. Um, rather than letting it go, um, you know. I mean, I don't think I'm. I don't think I'm declaring the death of anything other than that what you just described, which is the most extreme articulation of the avant-garde modus operandi, which is whatever's new is best. Forget what came before. Um, so that's. I don't know. I, I think that we're in a really interesting moment. I think things could go bad, but I think they're mostly going well. <laughs> <laughs> on, that, on that note, um, exhibitions.
traditions and that cabinet of curiosities was often a kind of a distillation of a, someone's longer view. Right? It took a long time to accrete. Mm -hmm. um, so there's an immediacy about the kind of curation where there's there's not much room for distillation and there's a sense that experiencing something is not adequate. You have to have documented it or yeah. created footage of it or something. But that, that sense of distillation uh, and immediacy, the whole sh idea of time around that has changed. And mm -hmm. I wondered how you saw that in terms of reflecting the activities of someone in terms of exhibition making. Exhibition making, or I mean, I was thinking. Curation. Yeah, I was thinking specifically of kind of what our our habit our habits on on our computers when in terms of what you were saying and how we don't we have a lot of access as well. We basically have access. We have access to one of each on our computers through the internet. Mm -hmm. But I think what often happens is that we don't we don't archive. We hoard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so we hoard. So I think all of us, me and myself included, you know, will have, I have um, so much on my computer that I thought I was going to watch, you know, or listen to, but it's just like sitting, just sitting there. Mm -hmm. When we had the ice storm in Toronto in December and I lost my internet for two weeks, I thought, oh, now's my chance to go into my media folders and actually engage with this stuff that I'm ho basically hoarding. Because as somebody who's always been like fixated with all sorts, all types of culture, you know, I, I remember like ten years ago when I could. There's a film that I really wanted to watch. I couldn't see, and I had to bid for the VHS cassette on eBay and pay you know seventy dollars for it. And now I can just I can watch it whenever I want. And you know the the other version of that is not even not even downloading something, but just it's out there streaming, and you never get around to it. <laughs> so. So that is kind of you know the, the 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 flip side of that obsessive archivalist, you know as Hans Ulrich Obrist actually calls it the protest against forgetting, that is very endemic to the cabinet of curiosities, where everything must be cataloged, and of course that's also I mean, you know, we shouldn't romanticize the cabinet of curiosities too much because it's, you know it's a it's an it's a, it's an outcropping of a highly colonialist and brutal time. Um, it, it represents conquest, um, but um, you know, in terms of in terms of exhibition making, it's a little. Well, I mean, you see it. You know, you see it when shows like major international shows like the Venice Biennale and document Documenta happen. Um, institutions go there shopping for works, and the artists who show in those events. Um, again, it's one of each. But you know what? It, this is not a new thing. You know, institutions have always been like that. And I was recently in Los Angeles, and uh, there are a lot of really beautiful private collections. But something like the Norton Simon, in its gorgeous, um, you know, collection of precious paintings, is still just one of each. You know, make sure you got a, you know, Degas. Make sure you got a Seurat. Make sure you know, just like it's still this wealthy kind of possessive way of looking at art and objects. I don't know if I've answered your question. Um, anyway, oh, I think you were first. Um, yeah, um, I heard that uh, some galleries are starting to kind of uh, shift their space to fit uh, the blog contemporary art daily, just because it's so intense and asking like what kind of picture you want and what oh. kind of angles, and so some new galleries are thinking about it while they're shaping their new space. And I was wondering if you think it's also something that's happening with artists. Like, are we, do you feel that it's going like curator, big star curator are shaping also artist processes or artists' work? Definitely. I mean, <laughs> I think that's true. Um, I, say, I say in my, in my book, this is, not, this is not like a revelation or anything, but all of the star curators, almost all of them, don't work for collecting institutions, which is the interesting thing. So they're not directly they're not directly connected to processes of collection, and yet they are. So you have like Massimiliano Gioni at the New Museum, which is non-collecting. They collect sometimes, um, but not a lot. Um, who else? Um, uh, Okwe Enwizor is at 
uh, Munich, um, Kutzala Munich, non-collecting. I mean, all the Kutzalas are non-collecting. But the thing is that like, once a star curator has curated a major show, it's very much like the fashion industry. So you can't, you know, you have, you have a show as a curator, it's a runaway show. You're setting a precedent. You're like presenting a lookbook for art. <laughs> and, and then, you know, you, that curator might not be directly involved in acquiring work, but it's, this se it's what's in this season. Um, but that is just like, I think that's, I feel like, I really hope that's dying out. It's becoming increasingly absurd as we can keep cycling back to the same things over and over and over again. Um, I hope we keep doing that to the point where nobody, curators included, knows what's trendy anymore. We're so we're so we're so close to that we're so close to that happening. Um, yeah. So you were next. Yeah. Um, I guess as we look to the history of um, curation, um, could the emerging decolonial discourse uh, help shape the contemporary curator? I think so, and I think it already has to a certain extent. I think there are a lot of really interesting projects that you can see in you know 1960s and 1970s. You know, Brazil, Argentina. There are a lot of really like radical forms of curation that are that are like that are genuinely oppositional. But it's hard to view those through the lens of Western curation, which we often do. You know. So we have like um, a show like uh, Les Magiciens de la Terre, which at the Pompidou in 1989, I believe, which was just like revived this summer as some kind of like pivotal moment in which the art world went global, which is super problematic. Um, but then you have even things like the Encyclopedic Palace Gioni show at the Venice Biennale, which was so widely praised. And yet he takes, he took a lot of um, work from you know, people who come from third world countries, people who um, are um, experiencing um, various states of, states of mental distress um, <laughs> and disability, and presented it in a pretty fetishistic ma manner as this kind of magical, these magical objects of the archive. Um, so, you know, that kind of thing is still, it's, it's something to be very on guard about. But I do think that there's like a, in, in a curator and performing value can empower. And I think that does happen um, in non-Western circumstances. I'm not an expert, unfortunately, in those practices, but I know that it happens. And I know in Latin America, it's partic there's some particularly exciting things going on. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I just wanted to come back to this really hopeful thing that you were talking about, of a sort of the tedium of this constant repetition burning out this phenomenon. But then before you were talking about this sort of the curator's this position within this anxiety complex, and anxiety doesn't seem to be diminishing. So I'm sort of curious how you see that the tedium will like are being tired of it, both like Trump are being anxious of wanting to be wrong. But it's like you're anxious, you're on this you're on this boat and it's sinking and you're really making you really anxious and then just like peace falls off, peace falls off, peace falls off, peace falls off, and you're like no, we can still do it. We can still do it. We can still do it. But then you just have to look for another boat. You're still going to be anxious on that boat, but it has to be another boat. Are there any other questions? This is a lovely note. Um, I had a question about, sort of in your historiography of uh, curation in uh, the art world, you sort of ended it in the early 2000s. Yeah. And I'm sort of curious about uh, particularly artist-run centers in Canada. Yeah. Um, there's uh, an, like an uptick in the number of in-house curators in artist-run centers. Mm. Um, where do you think that sort of fits in this narrative? I don't know. I mean, I there's there are several things you could say about that. And you could say that an artist-run center, I mean, artist-run centers are, um, you know, they they depend on a lot of grants, and I don't know if there's actual there's actual granting money for people to for institutions to employ curators when they didn't normally employ a curator. So a grant that would be specifically in place to help an artist-run center 
present more authoritatively as an institution by having a curator. I mean, I'm sure that's happened, you know? I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of like the specific nuances of the artist run center, but I'm sure that might be a part of it. Are you saying that, you know, having a curator in an artist run center is kind of like paradoxical and disturbingly hierarchical when <laughs> it should be run by artists? Well, you know, I, I think um, possibly that, but also um, I, I'm thinking particularly of uh, TPW. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking about uh, other institutions of the sort of, uh, sort of same vintage of, of TPW. Yeah. Uh, in, maybe they're becoming more institutional uh, in and of themselves, uh, but maybe they're uh, suggesting the continued relevance of, of someone who presents a narrative. I think, mm -hmm. for me at least, the, the sort of curatorial role is, is to take disparate ideas and bring something together. Just similar, yeah. You know, as much as, as people like Boriard can get a lot of slack, they also managed to sort of like, from a, a meta level, look at what was taking place and, and identify it and make it a teachable thing. Yeah. Um, so. And also, yeah, yeah. Um, I think one of the things that I think t we need to be on guard about, particularly in Canada, because we have such an amazing artist run center culture in Quebec in particular, is not to, because, you know, the example you bring up, and then there's also, you know, Mercer Union, like, there's this kind of, is it an artist-run center, or is it just of the pretense towards being a European Kunsthal or Kunstverein? And it's kind of like, just be a Canadian artist-run center, and do, like, do that unique thing that you do. Because the Mercer Union has certainly changed a lot since, you know, even, like, the mid-90s. And now its pretensions are very Kunsthal. And, um, and in fact, now it has a, a Scottish um, curator, Irish? Irish, Irish, an Irish curator who's amazing. Um, but nonetheless, there's this sort of, you know, it's an importation of a curator. And Georgina's worked with Jens, and she's worked with all these people. You know, she has a pedigree. Um, so, you know, and she's doing great things, and she's actually being very mindful. She did like an amazing amount of studio visits when she first came there, and she's being very mindful of continuing the spirit of Mercer. Um, but it's definitely, you bring up a good point. And you also bring up a good point in terms of like, there is the collective activity, but there's also somebody who needs to be kind of maybe at the center of that. Like, as, you know, and the other thing that I didn't mention is that, you know, the, the one of the first curators in Rome were, they were basically ambassadors. Like they were, they were ambassadors. And the, and the curate, the, the parish priest, is also just like, Parish priest was poor, was a poor, poor man, typically, who just like ministered to a parish and represented the clergy and represented the gospel. So in a way, that's like the heart of curation is representing being an ambassador, um, so being an ambassador for art. That's the curator in its like most ideal form. Yeah. I'd like to follow on that in regards of, uh, as you mentioned in your introduction, the Art Basel and the Louis Vuitton Foundation, for example, and we've seen manifestations of collaborations with like Tracy Evan and Bill Westwood and Mark Jacobs has been like, doing a lot of curatorial and yeah. collaboration. Yeah. I'm wondering if uh, the wealth has basically shaped the cultural understanding of the art world, this is like on one hand, and if maybe somehow we'll be seeing a uh, sub curatorial kind of like um, behavior activity happening. I just wonder if there's like some sort of maybe a response in this regard or... I don't know. You know this idea of success and status, which mm -hmm. could be, uh, you're, you're only talking about the superstars, <laughs> and you're not talking about the other ones, right? Mm -hmm. So I wonder if the, I mean, is it because they're doing relevant work or is it just a matter of like exposure and you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Well, this is what you're just, you just basically are describing the, like a fundamental pattern of the art world, of art, world, art in the West, like, I think. Um, so it's not like, you know, at least in the modernist moment or the pre-modernist moment, right? Because you have within the avant-garde um, in the early 20th century, you have a whole bunch of groups that were 
you know, initially quite obscure, um, and then their work slowly gets absorbed by the institution and by the mainstream, or maybe quickly. But it is important to point out too that like the conceptualist moment in the 60s and 70s, like even somebody like Vito Acconci, who um, was, you know, struggled and struggled to materialize his work to the point where he could make a living, because you've got to make a living, right? Was producing, was producing sketches for the sheer purpose of selling them, sketches based on his performances. Because even in the 70s and 80s, when he, was a, when he became an art star, he still wasn't making money. Um, so I don't know. I don't think it's cynical for me to say, you, you, make, you make a really good point in terms of all of these like high-powered fashion designers entering the fray and shaping, shaping exhibitions and becoming sort of curatorial. Um, but I think there will always be people who resist that. Um, it's just kind of this dance that the art world plays. Um, I don't know if I'm avoiding your question. <laughs> 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 it's expecting too much of me. <laughs> but you make you make a really good point in the yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. One more question, yeah. Um, in chapter five you talked about um, celebrity curating people like Madonna um, appropriating uh, elements from the avant garde. Um, and you talk about that having a, a sort of colonialist intent. Um, can you just describe what you mean by that, and then also tell me how that, how would someone like um, Dan Wieser or other uh, celebrity curators, um, how that would sort of tie in, or where, where does that situate that? Yeah, ugh, yikes. Um, <laughs> well, I think that um, Madonna is, I talk in my book about how she's a vampire, and how, <laughs> and how the vampiric mode is very curatorial. Um, and, um, and the vampiric mode is also very colonialist um, in terms of, you know, finding something and feeding off of it. Um, so I actually, like, love Madonna. Like, love her. So, so but, you know, she is what she is. And uh, so, it's, you know, it's, it's deeply problematic, you know, when, when Madonna, for example, um, the most famous example, the most famous colonialist example of um, Madonna um, uh, is Vogue, you know, of, of, of entering, of, of, I don't even know if she physically entered the hall room, the, sorry, the Harlem ballroom voguing scene of the late 80s. Um, but um, if, you've, if you've seen the documentary Paris is Burning, which itself is um, in a way a colonialist practice, um, but it shows, it's a window into um, into uh, the sort of gleeful subversion that was the ballroom scene in Harlem at the time. Um, and it is, um, you know, Madonna is really interested in power. Um, she performs power. And I think it's fascinating. I mean, I think Vogue is like, Vogue by Madonna is like a total masterpiece. Um, <laughs> like for everything, for everything that's wrong with it, for everything that it unsettles, and also for everything that it celebrates, I think it's just such a complex cultural text. Um, but there is definitely a strong, strong colonial <laughs> element to it. Um, and Madonna's always been, you know, and Madonna, I guess, paid her dues on the streets of New York, whatever. Um, so it's kind of like, it's kind of like what she's always done, but like, you know, right up into like, you know, the, the you know, the crunking fa fad of like five years ago, she was, she's, she's always looking to the streets to see what's happening. And often those people are, you know, low income people of color who are creating a very like complex and um, vibrant culture that she is then kind of plucking out. And as far as the um, people like Enwezor, you know, I'm not gonna stand here and tell you that Enwezor, who's like a brilliant mind and who does great work, is an example of affirmative action because that would be horrible for me to say. But I do, I will say that there are certain, there are institutions that, that use him 
in that manner um, as kind of like, oh, he's the black, he's a black star curator. You know, he can talk about, you know, he can talk about, um, you know, non-white art for us. Let's get him to do that. And th those kinds of things really rub me the wrong way. Um, you know, the art world is really good at compartmentalizing um, its damage control. So it'll, it'll, it'll like the, like the, like the university. So it's like, it'll see a problem, it'll redress it by putting a figure in place, and I'll just be like, hey, that's solved. You know, like Magician de la Terre. It was like, okay, now the art world went global, that's solved. Well, what about your condescending attitude towards anything that doesn't come from Europe? You're condescending towards it, you're including it, but you're condescending towards it. Um, yeah, you're curating in a certain way. So it's deeply problematic, and it, colonial patterns continue to exist in the art world. Provincialisms belong together. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't have the star curator, yeah. right? And we're always looking for somebody to <coughs> the outside to discover us and, and put, you know, and put value onto us, right? Um, so we had a really recent example in terms of the O Canada exhibition, right? Mm -hmm. Where Canadian artists were cherry picked in a particular way mm -hmm. to represent something. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? O Canada specifically? Yeah. Well, I would say that we do. Well, we we have Kitty Scott, who's a who's who's kind of our star curator in her own way. But I think she kind of rejects a lot of the aspects of star curating. But Oh Canada, I never saw it because <laughs> I just didn't. This is a long story. It's a long story. Um, but the idea of Oh Canada, yeah. But there, but there was a there was a practice of people not seeing that show because of the idea of an American coming in with a very mm -hmm. particular sensibility who was yeah. pro projecting a type of thing and there was a refusal. There was multiple levels of refusal. So when she went to Vancouver, uh -huh. um, there was the turning of the backs of a lot of the uh, art community there to her. Yeah. There was an incredible under-representation of Vancouver-based practices within the exhibition. Yeah, because she didn't, she doesn't like that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's right. And you know, speaking of curator porn, like there are these photos, there are these photos circulating her at the time, where she was, you know, record number of studio visits. These photos of her, like on a dog sled, like in a big park. Uh, <laughs> so ridiculous, you know, so ridiculous. Like I mean, I guess my main problem with that show, and a lot of like artists that I love are in that show, but it definitely was not a show if that was about everything that's going on in contemporary art in Canada, um, Denise is like, she's interested in craft-based practice, she's interested in outsider art, she's interested in like in folk art and figurative art, and you know, those are the things that she showed for the most part. So it was, in that sense, it was a curationist endeavor for sure. It was definitely the curator was front and center. And, and I think like, one of the one of the things I talk I use the um, adjective flattened a lot. <sighs> Such a pessimist, um, but the but it had a flattening effect. That's the worst kind of curating. Has that flattening effect where everything looks the same, where all the art looks like a selfie, you know. <laughs> and I think that you know I haven't didn't see the show, but I've saw I've seen a you know I work for an art magazine. I've seen a lot of read a lot about it, seen a lot of installation shots, and yeah, a little samey, a little samey, and very much the curator at the center. Right, and so through the curatorial gesture, she homogenized yeah. a lot of work. Yeah, and you know, anyone who's, who's gone through like the academic mill, like I have stopped at my master's, but there is a definite awareness that like, brand yourself. Brand yourself, come up with an idea that's yours alone, like you study like, leaves in late 18th century Gothic literature. That's what you do. <laughs> and curators are exactly the same way. They need to market themselves. They need to have a specialty. And that's Denise had her specialty, and she performed it, you know? So she's not the only one.
No, but it's a recent example because I find that you're really touching on international models, which is great. Um, however, we've got this we've got this situation in terms of our funding structure, in terms of the parallel gallery system. They, it, you know, uh, you kind of touched on the fact that they become grooming centers because we have we don't have the same marketplace mm -hmm. available. Yeah. We don't have the same kind of public institutions. Yeah. We don't have those kind of. Power yeah. Power well, power actually, power in my book, I, there's a whole chapter. Uh, devoted to curatorial studies programs, and it's based around um, the document that Karen Love produced in Vancouver as a guidebook for curators. And basically, it's like Canada's there, and what Canada's doing in the book is saying, here's real curatorial work. Here's what actual curators do, not the star curators. Here's a day-to-day -day of the project management that's involved in really curating and looking for money where there is no money and trying to facilitate artist shows and trying to do that really hard work. And there's a lot of people in Canada who are doing very good curatorial work and working very, very hard. Um, and so I hope that that's reflected somehow in that, in that part of the book. But yeah, we don't have the celebrity system because we are so underfunded and there are, and our, and our, and, and, you know, on top of that, our art market is so tiny. Yeah. Our last question, yeah. Um, so you can hear me. I don't need to. Yeah, I'm sure. So um, I'm interested in in your conversation about the curator as a lot of different things, right? Fulfilling all of these different roles. Um, and it's interesting to think about them as the, the sort of benevolent third party that is either going to hold our hand and kind of show us what we're meant to see, um, but also having this other develop, um, dimension of providing the context to shock us or to inspire that new knowledge and how you see that role factoring in when we all become the curator or you know when something like the algorithm on Facebook chooses to show me nothing that will make me upset <laughs> so, you know, how, where how do how do I involve an intermediary or a, another party in what's already kind of always predetermined yeah well unfortunately I think my answer to this is that you gotta like, you just gotta be your own curator now. <laughs> and you gotta do it in a way that um, is interesting and in a way that you don't, you don't go to all, you know, you don't put it on cruise control. And you know, like the best, the best shows that I've seen lately are shows in which I know that the artist has had a direct hand in. Like another skill among the many that you now have to have, unfortunately, is that you kind of have to know how to curate your own work. Um, and you kind of have to see possibility, exhibition possibilities for yourself. Um, and I think, I hope that, that artists will become, like, now that artists are, you know, that avant-garde practice has completely been assimilated institutionally, um, that, um, that artists will be given uh, more control over what they show, and that curators will, you know, because their curators will be these, will become these amazing, generous facilitators and collaborators to help, like editors, like editors for writers, to help you be the best artist you can be, rather than you know, like what you know, Donald Judd had a problem with Harold Zaman. It's just like you can't put my work in that thematic. That's not right for me. Um, it's like in getting a draft back from an editor and just being like, okay, well, that's that's not what I sound like. Um, that ideally the curator, the contemporary curator, should be a nurturing figure, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I really just think that the curator is an, is essential, but the, when the curator has an authorial role, like an exclusive authorial role, it's just deeply problematic. You know, like I saw the the um, the Mike Kelly retrospective in Los Angeles at the Geffen, and Mike Kelly is one of my favorite artists. I think he's a total genius and. I was completely overwhelmed by the curatorial treatment of his work, and it was just—it was too conceptual, it was too thematic. It, there's too much noise going on. I yearn to see a trajectory of this person who basically like lived and breathed and died with art, and it wasn't there because it was too simple. Like it was too simple, and it's just like one one fears for the artists who are no longer with us and what the curators do with them. But like online. Um, Online, I think, like, and I talk to a lot of people who are like sort of experts in the digital field. Like the the algorithms that things like the, the entities like Facebook use are so facile. They are so facile. 
So you just have to just deconstruct them or something. There was a great article in Wired recently of somebody who just liked everything. Um, and what it, proved, uh, what it proved is that everything, when he liked everything, he got um, all advertisements, obviously, and then all right-wing like goofballs. That was what happened. Um, so, you know, like, I don't know. I don't know what to say. Ello's not the answer, but I just... <laughs> but there's a way of... But there's a way of being a smart curator online, and it's an ongoing pro cultural project. And being just aware is probably enough right now. That was a really wonderful talk. David has some books here, if any of you are interested in buying. Or, um, and at this point, I'd like to thank David for a really thought-provoking and interesting talk. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. And see you in two weeks.